Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Jane Gilbert, President and CEO of the ALS Association. The association is dedicated to fighting ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, and supports advocacy, research for a cure, and compassionate care of the 30,000 Americans affected by ALS. Jane joined the ALS Association in 2009 after being responsible for over 760 chapters of the Red Cross. She has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Jane, for joining us today. I'm delighted to be here. The ALS Association is an incredibly complex organization that has experienced explosive growth over the last 20 years. Talk about the structure of the organization that, that you lead and that serves this, this cadre of, of 30,000 uh, patients, their families who have to live with this devastating condition? Actually, our organization is not as complex as the disease itself is complex. And of course, that, by virtue of the complexity of the disease, makes serving the people living with it complex. So what we are is an association. It is a, a grouping of, we have 40 chapters across the United States, 34 certified centers, all dedicated, as well, of course, as our public policy and our, our research arms, all dedicated to finding the cause and the cure right. for ALS. The national organization was formed. It was a combination of two organizations nearly 30 years ago, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. When I was hired, it was in a growth mode. Um, and of course, that came along just about the time, the growth mode came along just about the time that the economy also presented some challenges. So when I was hired to take over the position, it was a, it was a complex, if you will, strategic initiative uh, brought about by the, what I consider the real foresight of the Board of Trustees to move the organization to a different level. We are the only organization dedicated solely to ALS as a specific disease. We work on research, we work on public policy, and of course we work on caregiving. And those three programmatic areas dictate how we structure and what we do at the national organization. Talk about the condition itself. It is so mysterious, uh, so famous, yet so unknown. It is a, a very uh, strange disease, uh, unknown in many ways because it is relatively rare. There are about 30,000 people living with the disease at any time in the United States. And the reason for that is because the longevity from diagnosis is usually an average of about two to five years. If people lived longer, it would be, and you extrapolated that out among the population, it would actually have the same prevalence as a disease like MS. But because people die so quickly, uh, there is no cure, there is no known cause for it, and there's no real treatment for it. And treatment, to the extent that it exists, and the allevi alleviation of pain and suffering, to the extent that it exists, is very uh, costly. The needs of ALS patients shift very, very quickly. Um, and by the time there's, there's any um, incentive, I hate to say this, to develop um, and invest in the development of, of cures on a commercial basis, people are gone. Um, and, and so this is one of those real orphan disease where there is no commercial logic that would support the type of services that patients need and the type of research that is required for a cure. Actually, I would have said that statement was very true uh, as, as recently as five years ago. In the last couple of years, we have seen great movement in the pharmaceutical industry to look at ALS research. And we take credit for that. The association does take credit for that. We have been very uh, supportive of young investigators looking at ways to bring people into the field of ALS research. And over the last four to five years, we really have seen a tremendous increase in the number of uh, scientists who really want to come to the disease and work on it. It is a neurological disease. Uh, devastating, as you've indicated. It, it starts with, it can actually start in a couple of ways, but the most common ways are either a bulbar onset, which is a lung involvement breathing, or a limb onset, which is usually indicative of a weak leg or a foot that drops or weakness in a hand or an arm. 
And so oftentimes, by the time the disease is diagnosed, it is difficult then to establish a protocol for treatment. One of the things that has been uh, particularly heartwarming from our standpoint is the recognition that our clinical setting, our certified centers, actually does stabilize and increase not only the quality of life, but also the, the length of life. And so we always encourage people to attend regularly a certified center and the protocol of care that is given by a grouping of multidisciplinary uh, people in that clinic certainly does help. One of the things that, is, that has really impressed me is how you have made the case and your people have made the case that research on ALS is not just about ALS. It, it is a, the, the type of a disease where the outcomes uh, of the research have so, such a broad application. I think that that has also changed some of the calculus behind, behind the investment That strategies. is certainly uh, a truism as well. There are a number of diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, all of which appear to be related. ALS is, we believe, a syndrome not unlike cancer where you have multitudinous right. numbers of cancer. Uh, there could be a number of things that, that uh, create the onset of ALS in a, in a patient, and we don't know what those are. But we do know that there are similarities between ALS, between Parkinson's, Huntington's, uh, even Alzheimer's with frontal temporal dementia. So there are a number of research arenas that make this a particularly interesting disease for researchers to be working on right now. As you shape your organization, you have so many different challenges. On the one hand, you, are, you need to have the expertise to guide research and to, and to make your bets in terms of how you will invest very scarce resources so that it is highly leveraged, that it incites additional investment, and that that investment has a specific return in a short period of time. So there's a whole competency set that needs to be built up on that side. On the other hand, the alleviation of, of pain and suffering and the psychological uh, counseling that goes with care to patients, services to families, is a completely different skill set. How do you manage an organization with, with such a dichotomy of skills that are required? Well, it really is an, uh, an interesting, if you will, uh, organization to manage. I like puzzles, I guess. I like putting things together and figuring out ways to solve problems. And this particular job was a perfect match for my skill set. That plus the fact that, as you know, uh, I had a direct interest in ALS. I have a very dear friend who lost not only her father to ALS 20 some years ago, but then lost her husband to ALS. And you know, that's like winning the lottery, only the bad lottery. And during the time that her husband was sick and also uh, a very close personal friend of mine, I remember saying to him, and I indicated this to you when you interviewed her, that it was in fact a, uh, one of the few things that I would really consider leaving the Red Cross for and would be a job that was of particular interest to me. So it's not only a job that fits my skill set, but it is a passion for me. Um, again, a difficult job in some ways because you are managing a diverse programmatic arena. I am not a scientist. I've never claimed to be a scientist. We are very fortunate in that we have one of the top scientists, Dr. Lucy Bruin, yes. who actually is located in London. And people often ask me, how can you run an organization with your chief scientist in London? But the reality is that Lucy uh, knows everyone in the field of ALS, both research and clinicians, and makes a point of um, working with young scientists and encouraging them to come into ALS research. And we then take the money that our donors so generously give us, and we send that money to the programs where we feel we will get the largest return on those investments. And again and again, this has proved to be the case, where we have invested what some would consider a small amount of money, but the return has been phenomenal. And some of the most recent um, scientific discoveries with ALS have occurred as a direct result of some of the investments we've made, either in studies, clinical trials, um, and or just general basic research. So we've been very blessed with uh, Lucy's participation. And in addition to those scientific competencies um, that you engage, uh, you also have uh, a, a cadre of caregivers. We do. And then those caregivers from the central offices are, are providing support to other caregivers throughout your, your 40 chapters. How does that work? 
Well, I, and again, a, a, an interesting program to manage. Our care services component of the organization lies at the local level. And part of my responsibility and something I believe absolutely um, just from the tip of my toes uh, is that local involvement. It's so important to have people at the local level. If you live in an area, and particularly if you suffer from ALS, you can't go hundreds of miles for treatment, or it's unusual that you can. Perhaps early in the diagnosis, yes, but as the diagnosis progresses, as the disease progresses, it's very important that we have people who can provide those care services to the people directly in their homes. And so our chapters, the 40 chapters across the United States, provide exactly that. They have support groups. They have people who go out into the homes and do assessments. We have loan equipment programs. Uh, anything that you can think of that would make living with the disease easier. And of course, you know, it isn't just the person suffering from the disease. It's the entire circle of family and friends. So by uh, the very virtue of the disease itself, which does, and I should have said this earlier, really literally completely incapacitates someone living with it. It goes from, um, from onset very quickly usually to the point where you can't move arms, legs, you're either confined to a wheelchair, sometimes even to uh, a bed, uh, unless someone moves you and lifts you. So you're completely paralyzed, often down to the use of maybe a finger or a toe or even the blink of an eye. And so it, it is a, um, a disease that not only robs the person who's living with it of their ability to communicate, but it then, by its very uh, nature, means that the people surrounding that person must be very attuned to being able to communicate on his or her behalf. The organization that you're describing is an organization of leaders. You cannot be the key researcher, uh, nor would you want to be. You cannot be the key caregiver, nor would you want to be. You need people who are going to lead those functions. So what is your role as a chief executive when you have a, a group of leaders, experts in their fields? Um, what is, how do you interact with, with this cadre of people, all of whom um, have a uh, desire, um, they take initiative, they are accustomed to independence. Uh, how does that work? Actually, that's part of the fun of it from my standpoint. Uh, one of the reasons I was hired was for that exact purpose. Uh, we knew that we needed to grow the organization, or the board recognized that they wanted to grow the organization, and they wanted somebody who could assemble a team of professional people to really take it to the next level. And I have been in the enviable position uh, to hire those people. And my management style, and I know people say this, but, it, but I really believe this, is, is that you hire the very best people you can and then get out of the way and let them do their jobs. And our management team, which is just really completely fully assembled as of this past couple of weeks, in fact, with the hiring of a new chief development officer, um, is a group of strong-willed, very determined people. And I find that kind of dialogue around a management table extremely helpful. It is very um, informative, it's lively, it's interesting, and um, usually, not usually, I think always, gives us a, a better product at the end of the day because we don't necessarily all agree all the time. We have a number of people who, as I said, have strong personalities, know their craft well, have uh, a really specific design in mind for their particular department, and but it's always helpful to have others kind of poke holes in it, if you will, or at least to offer insight and input. And one thing that we have done quite successfully is to kind of take down those silos and really work on the disease uh, as a management team, as opposed to care services versus public policy versus chapters. Uh, versus clinical issues, it really does help us to all sit at the table. And while I know nothing about science, it's important that I understand it. So it then is incumbent on Lucy and our communications director to be able to articulate that science in terms that you or I or the people living with the disease can really understand. How does fundraising work? If you have uh, a New York chapter and you have a New York donor, an LA chapter and an LA donor, there must be some times when um, the approach to that donor 
um, uh, ends up having to be discussed and adjudicated and, and perhaps resolved in terms of, of how that works. That's one of the things that I think probably is a, a strength of what we have been able to accomplish over the last several years, and that is to try and remove the competition. Inherently, in any national association, there's going to be a tension between a national organization and those chapter affiliates, and regardless of how you're structured. Right. Um, and we found that. Uh, it was my goal to eliminate that competition. I won't sit here and tell you that it's completely gone, but we have done a what I consider to be a really um, light years ahead leap in terms of the way we operate with our chapters. No, nobody from the national organization goes into an arena, be it New York, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, or, or uh, LA, without first being sure that the executive is involved with that call, that they understand that we're going to be in their area looking at major donors. And we're finding a real funnel back and forth between our chapters and between the national organizations. So that if we have a national donor, and I'll use research as an example, if we have a national donor who is particularly interested in research and that donor comes through the chapter, the chapter then is given a percentage of that donation against their operating budget. We found that to be very successful. Um, and certainly, all donors are local. You know that. Yep. And, and most people uh, certainly are aware of the fact that I can't, well, sometimes my position is a bit of a cachet with the donor. It's, uh, it really, they live in an arena, in a local arena. And every donor is local. And every donor has a feeling about how they want their money spent. So we pay particular attention to that. And I think we've really done a pretty remarkable job of uh, eliminating that competition factor. We've still got a ways to go. We've still got programs in place to uh, make it more direct and more understandable. But we cultivate donors together. And we particularly do that well, I believe, at the corporate level, where a corporation may have subsidiaries in local communities where it really behooves them to have a local presence, and yet they want to do something nationally as well. So we do a split, and it just has, it has been very successful for us. It's very much uh, in alignment with what happens in the private sector as well, Absolutely. when you have different regions or different subsidiaries or different groups um, with overlapping uh, uh, customer bases, um, and uh, there needs to be some form or some structure that allows them to collaborate and also recognizes each contribution to success. Absolutely. In terms of how governance works, you're an association, so you have 40 chapter, uh, chapters in 40 states, and you also uh, have uh, boards. So there are uh, a, a large number of, of independent boards, uh, 501c3s, uh, and then you have this, this um, national uh, board. How does governance work? Well, we have just undergone, in, uh, since I've been on board, again, a reorganization of our governance structure. We do have a national board of trustees. They are elected by a newly created board of representatives. And that board of representatives is a representative of each chapter mm -hmm. in the network. We have a voting and a non-voting representative who sits on that advisory board. Uh, the non-voting representative is usually the executive who knows kind of the inner workings, if you will. And the voting representative is a key volunteer, usually a board chair or an immediate past board chairman. And they are, uh, that has been created, the governance revamp, if you will, has been created over the last couple of years. We're now into our second full year of operation. And as you can well imagine, there have been some growing pains with it. But I think that storming phase is coming to an end, and we really are uh, in the midst of what I consider to be a very valuable and very worthwhile governance structure that will allow us to, yes, have the local boards and have their autonomy, uh, but also have those local boards feel as though they have some involvement in what's happening at the national level. They don't necessarily have a say-so, and of course there's been, a, been some uh, governance versus management issues that right. we've had to deal with. But for the most part, uh, they really have come to the plate wanting to be helpful and, and wanting to be a part of the organization and helping us move it forward. It's a valuable, valuable tool, and I think will be a strength for us in years to come that uh, we probably haven't 
scratch the surface of how valuable they could be. What is next for the ALS Association? What type of, of, of initiatives do you have, uh, do you wish to pursue over the next five years? Like most not-for-profits, our goal is certainly to grow our donor base and to bring more financial resources into the research arena. We are just uh, finishing up and have are, are really working on a, uh, a good strategic planning process. We have a very good three-year plan, strategic plan, and we're now just now implementing some of the pieces of that uh, that will allow us to move the organization to the next level. Our goal is to grow research substantially, mm -hmm. to also grow our care services, i.e. be sure that the chapters have the resources locally so that we don't just focus on research, but we focus as well on the local entities and allow them to grow so that they have adequate resources to care for the people living with the disease, to support their families, and to be sure that that standard of care is at least uh, equitable across the country. And then the third leg of that stool is our public policy arena, and we've been extremely um, productive in the public policy arena. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but vet veterans, as an example, are twice as likely to develop ALS as the normal population. We don't know why. We don't know uh, the cause of ALS, so it is difficult for us to, to ascertain why veterans, but we have been able to um, lobby so that the veterans' families now receive uh, veterans' benefits, which has been a tremendous boost to people living with the disease. We have the only fully funded ALS registry through the CDC looking for, in fact, it's just in its infancy, but we are working uh, with the government, with the CDC, to populate that registry and be sure that we get as many people as we possibly can into the registry. And when that information comes out, we are hopeful that it will show clusters. It may show some environmental factors. So, um, you know, as we move forward into the next three to five years, all three of those arenas are potential for growth. And, of course, we're always looking for new ways to serve people living with the disease. So we're always open to partnerships, um, other diseases that may have a, an affinity uh, with us, and I mentioned some of those earlier, to, to partner with them in terms of studies and clinical opportunities. Uh, there's lots of areas for growth around this disease. Well, Jane Gilbert, thank you so much for sharing the newer developments uh, that the ALS Association is driving, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you very much. I was delighted to be part of it.